Brave and bold or same old, same old? Two ends of the spectrum when it comes to Canada's broadcasting and telecommunications legislative review panel's final report. The result of 18 months of industry experts hearing from all walks of life about what is needed in this country as the industry grapples with new limber competitors in their traditional world. Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. The federal government's aim was to modernize three pieces of legislation which govern Canada's broadcast and telecommunications industries. The report provides us with 97 recommendations for the industry. Some may never see the light of day, while others, well, they could bring some challenges. Netflix scoops up viewers from traditional broadcasters. With technology now, anyone can become a broadcaster with very little financial cost. Do social media giants like Facebook and Twitter need to be brought under government oversight? And should the CBC get out of the advertising game, which has been the bane of private broadcasters, considering it is government-funded? Just a few angles to look at at the Unpublished Cafe today. Joining us will be conservative industry critic Michelle Rempel-Garner, as well John Lawford of the Public Interest Advocacy Centre presented at the hearings. Paul Daly is a lawyer and law professor at the University of Ottawa. Tom Korski is the managing editor of Black Locks Reporter, an online subscriber-based news service. And starting us off today is Michael Geist, a law professor at the University of Ottawa, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law and is a member of the Centre for Law, Technology and Society. And Michael, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me. Now, did you see a need for a review of the industry? Well, listen, I think some of the laws certainly date back before the Internet became such a major player in our communication system. And so there's unquestionably value in re-examining where the law is at and ensuring that it, it meets the needs of today. I think part of the problem is that some of the proposals that we see basically are the solutions of yesterday as opposed to being the kind of forward-looking things that we need. What are the needs of today? Well, I think there's no question that the Internet's playing a pretty significant, dramatic role, and of course, in the way that we communicate. I think that means it's essential that all Canadians have access. I think it's essential that we have net neutrality principles to ensure that all players are treated equally. And those are the, that's, to me, really the bedrock of where we start. We've got some of those rules already in place, but I think that we can do better. And when it comes to addressing some of the challenges that some of the existing broadcasters or broadcast distributors face, I think the core question that's, that's now been raised through this report is whether or not we want to adopt a kind of regulate all approach or recognize that in many respects what the internet has done is flower new kinds of competition and competitors. This podcast would be an example of that. And whether or not we want to ensure that um, we allow that kind of competition to blossom as opposed to seek to regulate and seek put levies on many of those kinds of activities. And that's what I, I, I gathered from, from uh, your, your point of view or your submission uh, to the panel is that you, you feel it's going to bring a lot more government oversight. I think it's going to bring a lot more regulation, to be sure. It's, it will create uh, an enormous amount, it vests an enormous amount of power in our regulator, the CRTC. It, it will determine huge numbers of, of issues that I think a lot of people may not be wholly comfortable with, you know, and, and right down to on the news regulation side, which I know you'll be addressing, the notion that the CRTC would identify which Canadian news sites are trusted news sites and then mandate that other sites link to those sites and actually decide how they would do so to ensure that they're sufficiently discoverable. It would require levies and payments from services around the world. As long as they've got Canadian users, the CRTC could, in theory, require everybody from Skype and WhatsApp to pay for Canadian broadband to other online services, the Netflixes of the world, to fund Canadian content or to fund the Canadian news media. And I'm not sure that that's a model that uh, we ought to be adopting. In fact, I am quite sure it is not a model we ought to be adopting. And why is that? Well, I think for one thing, there's an enforcement problem to be sure. I don't think it's appropriate for the CRTC to, to be engaging in the sorts of activities. I don't think that there is an emergency in many of these sectors right now. Let's take film and television production as, as sort of the paradigm example, because that's where a lot of the attention is right now. The reality is that Canada has never seen more film and TV production take place in Canada than it is right now. And in fact, even with respect to certified Canadian content, so-called CanCon, 
the last two years have been two of the biggest years we've ever seen as well. Netflix, according to the CRTC, is now the largest investor in production in Canada. There is no emergency taking place. In fact, what we're seeing is that the policies of yesterday that established a strong sector, one that's attractive for people to come invest in and participate in, is working. And the idea that we would now seek to regulate and mandate all kinds of new payments into the system just doesn't make sense given the, the actual state of the market. Michael Geist is joining us on the Unpublished Cafe. He is the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law as we discuss the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Legislative Panel Review Report. And, you know, we just saw the, the new NAFTA w- was signed. And do you think some of these recommendations might violate the, the new wording? I do. In fact, I don't think there's any question that they do. You know, one of the the core principles that the panel says that they've adopted is what they call like for like, the idea that if we treat Canadian broadcasters or broadcast distributors like cable companies in one in, in a certain regulatory fashion, then we ought to be treating the online equivalent wherever they happen to be located in the same fashion. Now, people can get on board with that principle, but the problem is that if you take a look at what takes place in Canada, we don't treat these services in a like-for-like fashion. So broadcasters, for example, have all sorts of regulatory advantages from redistributing the content through the co- with, with copyright laws help facilitate to the must carry rules that say that you've got to buy access to certain channels even in basic subscription packages to the to to the simultaneous substitution rules that broadcasters use to replace their commercials for US commercials they've got all those kinds of advantages and they've got access to certain kinds of funding that the foreign players don't and so the idea that we say like for like yet on the one hand say you've got to pay in if you're a foreign player, but you don't have access to all the local benefits. From my perspective, that's quite clearly discrimination, and it would be a violation of the the new treaty that's been passed between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, and would open the door to hundreds of millions of dollars in retaliatory tariffs, which the U.S. could use to target really any sector they want. It could be dairy. It could be the steel sector. It could be anywhere they want with maximum, in a sense, pain points to pay back for the kind of costs that Canada would be levying, in effect, on some of the foreign players. Did you get the perception in reading a report, the CRTC, which has oversight on the industry, just seemed to be trying to make itself more relevant today? I don't think the C- it's not the CRTC in this instance. I think it's the panel that's doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the CRTC's come up with some really problematic recommendations of its own. They've, they had a report in, which they called Harnessing Change, which, as the title suggests, indicates that the CRTC thinks it can harness all of this online activity. And it actually even in some respects went further. It wanted people to pay extra levies on their Internet services and their wireless services, which are already some of the costliest in the world, to help fund Canadian content. So I don't, I frankly think their report and recommendations were highly problematic as well. But it's not the CRTC that's suggesting it. It's actually this panel. And this panel on so many of the really contentious issues actually punts on some of these things. They actually don't make a core decision. They, in a sense, leave it to the CRTC. Think, for example, of video games. And the panel says, well, we're not necessarily recommending that video games be regulated in the same way, but we've created a structure that would open the door to that if the panel would choose to move in that direction, or the CRTC, rather, would choose to move in that direction. So there is that possibility of the CRTC, as I say, deciding who's a trusted news source, deciding what makes something discoverable, deciding who has to pay for all of these extra levies, and then even going further and deciding if when they want to expand this into everything from device manufacturers to operating systems to video games. In theory, there's almost no limit to the scope of regulation, levies, registration that the panel envisions. What in the final report do you point to that is right for Canada? Well, I think the the content provisions, as we've been talking about, are enormously problematic. That said, I think there are some good things in there. I think, for example, they've got um, some really valuable recommendations to ensure there's better public participation 
when it comes to some of these decisions. And, and there's some irony there, given that it's a pretty small panel that's making these recommendations. But longer term, they envision the CRTC um, doing a better job of ensuring that Canadians' views are well incorporated into decisions. I think their CBC recommendations of moving towards a, a commercial-free CBC uh, or a non-commercial CBC, I think, is a, is a really interesting proposal. I think it's one that sort of recognizes that it's at a time when it can be hard to distinguish between commercial broadcasters and the CBC. If we are going to have a public broadcaster, then surely it needs to be doing something different from what we get in the commercial space and moving to uh, a non-commercial or commercial-free CBC that would allow it to pursue ventures and venues and programming irrespective of the commercial benefits, I think, in many ways, would help distinguish it from some of the commercial alternatives. Michael, I want to thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Michael Geist is the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law. I should mention that Heritage Minister Stephen Guibo was invited to join us on the podcast, but his schedule did not line up. When the report was released, he mentioned the licensing of trusted news sites, which, well, created a firestorm of controversies for its implication that the government would be registering news sites for Canadians. He probably had to recant that, but not before the damage was done. Tom Korski is the managing editor of Black Locks Reporter, and he joins us now. And, and Tom, does this report bring any clarity to the government's vision for broadcasting and digital in today's world? Uh, that uh, broadcast and telecom review uh, uh, act review uh, report is absolutely devastating. Uh, they, they are they're 100% clear, Ed. Uh, they say they want all Internet content providers to register. That includes newsrooms. Now, where there has been some garbling, uh, and uh, the minister and the chair of the review panel didn't help, is they use registration and licensing as synonyms, and they're not, and they're completely different. And then they play the game of parsing words. Allow me to explain in 20 seconds or less. <laughs> Licensing is for radio and TV stations because you're using the airwaves. That's a public utility. You get a five-year license, and every five years you have to go back to the CRTC to get a license renewal. Lots of strings attached. Registration, uh, where does that exist in uh, Internet media? Nowhere outside of North Korea or China. There is no registration scheme for media in Canada. Never has been. In fact, it's unconstitutional. This goes back 400 years. And I asked the chair of the broadcast review panel, well, we're not going to register. We don't want your money. We don't want your subsidies. We're not going to register. We don't think you're qualified to come up with a code of conduct, which applies to registrants. Now what? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, enforcement is a different issue, said Ms. Yale. Enforcement is the issue. Big problem, Ed. You know, we're all bombarded with news and information from every angle. Do Canadians need somebody to point out what is trusted and what is not? Uh, I, the the implication is that people are dangerous morons. Uh, I don't believe that. But there's something else. You know, when the Constitution, and they wrote it, it wasn't a bunch of uh, broadcasters, newspaper guys, or editors who wrote the Constitution. They wrote it. They said freedom of the press. So freedom from what? What does that mean? Ed? Freedom from government regulation. That's the whole point. And so as soon as you start sending the government man into the newsroom, whether it's newspapers and he's got a briefcase full of subsidy cash, or it's mother's little helper, the CRTC, because they want you to register so they can help you, uh, achieve accuracy. You know, this came up in uh, Commons uh, Heritage Committee hearings. The minister was there, and there was an MP from uh, southwest Alberta named Martin Shields, and he said, this scares the hell out of me. Whenever I see the government use words like accuracy in news, it's just deeply, deeply disturbing. The minister did not do well in answering the questions, but there was one useful piece of information from that entire hearing. They're already writing the bill, Ed. They already mm. sent the bill to the yeah. Department of Justice, and they're writing it as we speak. That's what's going on. Does the government have a role to play in supporting local news and journalism? Or is it... Zero it, role. Zero role. Stay out of it. Yeah. They, uh, 
you know, they can't even buy submarine parts or fix potholes on the road. Just stay the hell out. This is so beyond their professional training. They have no expertise. They are so conflicted. They are uh, riven with uh, impulses for propaganda and control. Just stay the hell out. That's my opinion. Tom Korski joining us on the Unpublished Cafe is with Black Locks Reporter and Let's face it. Here in Canada, the CBC takes a lot up of a lot of error in the uh, the broadcast world. Do you feel, as it, one of the recommendations, it it should get out of the advertising game? Uh, that's a actually a, a, a narrow bureaucratic trick that is played by CBC executives, and it goes like this: Ed, they lost uh, their sixty five year monopoly on hockey broadcasting in twenty twelve to Rogers, which outbid them for the NHL license. People say, "Well, I still see the hockey game." on the CBC, uh, true, but it's under license from Rogers, and the CBC gets zero revenue from that. All they're doing is filling airtime. So the CBC lost uh, 37% of its English language TV ad revenue last year. You think about that. Mm -hmm. If you're in any business and 37% of your ad revenue went out the door, you would have uh, sales reps jumping out of windows. And then you say, well, everyone likes CBC Radio. That's what everybody says. I hear that all the time. Uh, interestingly, uh, five years ago, the CBC tried to sell uh, advertising on its radio network, which is a monopoly. There is no comparable private sector radio hookup nationally. They missed their advertising targets by 97%. Even the CRTC said, it was minuscule ad revenue. They couldn't even do that right. So they now want to, you know, like pacifism is no virtue in the toothless. The CBC can't sell ads. So they have said, we really wish you'd just give us the grants so we don't have to bother trying anymore. CBC is in big trouble in the marketplace. This is not about conservatives or CBC haters or the rest of it. They're dying in the marketplace. Ed. Their audience and their ad revenues Tom, are you there? I still am. Okay, sorry, we lost you there at the end. Um, you know, I, I find it interesting, though, when, when you look at the numbers, and when the ratings come out, they're usually at the top with a, with a dominant share. How could anybody not turn that into money? Because those are, uh, on the television side, those are old uh, data, Ed. Uh, Hockey Night in Canada was their moneymaker for... 65 years. The, the, the margin on hockey broadcast, profit over cost, was about 400%. Absolute cash cow. They lost hockey. They lost the network. You look at top 30 television language, uh, English language programs in Canada, they almost never, almost never make the top 30. And to make the top 30, you need a minimum audience of about, you know, maybe 600, 700,000. Ed, this is a country of 37 million people. Mm -hmm. CBC is crashing and burning. They're local supper time newscasts. You're in the news business. That's your bread and butter. I'm telling you, this is where people connect with their community. The community sees the reporter, the photographer, the editor in the field. They see the personalities. That's your connection. You lose that connection, you lose the business. Their local television audience for their 6 p.m. supper time newscast nationwide in English is 300,000 people. 300,000 people. are That means in a city the size of Ottawa, they have an audience of about 7,000. It's ridiculous. You know, I've all, often felt that the lack of competition in the, in the industry, broadcasting in general, has been the biggest problem since we've seen all the, uh, the amalgamation. Uh, from, from this perspective, do you think we can go back? Go back to the days of the One Channel Universe and the CBC gets no, all no, the money no, at once. Days, <laughs> days, to the days where you couldn't own everything in one market. I, I, I think it's happened already. Mm -hmm. I, already th I, I think it's happened already. People have so much choice. And what's wrong with that? I mean, it's fantastic. There's so much choice. You can get literally whatever you want. Now, if you're, for instance, a crown corporation like the CBC, that's a big problem. You know, for their national newscast, you know, the famous national newscast, flagship newscast, mm. is under, on some weeks, 300,000. 
when I was a kid, you remember Don Messer? Yep. Don Messer's Jubilee, it had an audience of 3.2 million, Ed. It was square dance. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happened to the CBC. Tom Korski, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, my pleasure, Ed. Always good to talk to you. Tom Korski, managing editor of Black Locks Reporter. Canadians continue to log on to social media to get their information and entertainment. It's something Canadian broadcasters have been grappling with for years. But can you regulate those giants like Facebook and Twitter and Google? Paul Daly is a university research chair in administrative law and governance at U Ottawa, and he joins us now. And, and Paul, you call the report bold and brave. Why and how? Well, I think, uh, first of all, you need to put uh, two points into context. First, as you've rightly said, this report is about Facebook, Google and Twitter, uh, social media behemoths, which dominate the public sphere and play an outsized role in, in our public life and political discussion. Um, and that has to be, uh, that has to be noted. Um, lots of controversy about whether Breitbart News is going to be regulated, but I think that's a distraction from the, the central point, which is uh, to regulate these, these behemoths, potentially. The second point is that the report here is a report produced by people who work in the telecommunications and broadcasting sectors, and these areas have long been subject to regulation even before modern administrative agencies were created, they were regulated by common law courts and by doctrines of the common law. So these two points have to be have to be borne in mind when we talk about the report and the potential for future regulation of social media and internet resources in Canada. Um, and what the report says and why I think it is bold and brave is that these bodies like Facebook, Google and, and Twitter they're really less like the, the Globe and Mail than they are like Hydro Ottawa or hydro uh, companies uh, around the country or utilities providers like Bell and Rogers. Um, and once you think that they're more like Bell and Rogers than the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star or the Toronto Sun, the case for regulation starts to look very different. And, and, and when you talk about uh, that look for regulation, why, how, did, how does it look different to you? Well, so if you t take the Globe and Mail, say, I mean, mm. you think about what Google is. Well, Google says it's a platform. Uh, Google is not a, a speaker as such. So the Globe and Mail, there's an editor who selects uh, what goes in the newspaper. There's quality control and all the rest of it. Google, however, is just a platform. It's a conduit uh, through which people can access news and other resources. So uh, when we talk about platforms and things that provide services, then we're really not in the realm of people who are speaking, who are expressing themselves. We're in the realm of utilities, which are providing public services. And utilities have a number of characteristics. Most importantly, it's very difficult for anyone to get into the market. It's very difficult for you or I to set up a wireless company because we don't have the billions of dollars you'd need to build the structures which would allow you to, uh, to uh, offer the services. Similarly, with something like Google or Facebook or Twitter, at this point, uh, because of the, the network effects of so many people using the platforms, the barriers to entry are very high. It's very difficult for anyone to get into the market um, of Internet search or Internet social media uh, platforms, certainly not to, to rival Facebook and Twitter. Um, and that's a, a key consideration. And that's why uh, the report suggests that they're much more like utilities, like Bell, like Rogers, than they are like people expressing themselves like you on your podcast or uh, the Globe and Mail. So they're not creating the content, they're just transmitting the content. Well, that's been the, the argument mm -hmm. Google, Facebook and Twitter have made. Um, now, of course, many of the decisions they take about how their algorithms prioritize search results or how Twitter prioritizes popular content, these do have an important effect on public life and political discussion. They do shape the world in which we live. But as such, Twitter is not speaking. You or I, uh, we, we speak through Twitter. We use the platform to speak. Um, and that's the, that's the key difference. Is it even possible for Canadian lawmakers to regulate companies such as Facebook and Google? Well, one of the fascinating struggles we're seeing across the world at the moment is the, uh, the struggle to uh, apply national domestic law to these multinational corporations, whether it's Amazon paying taxes, 
whether it's Uber uh, respecting employment standards and giving workers time off and sick pay, things like that. Uh, we're seeing many cases of uh, national and domestic laws being applied to these multinational companies. Um, I don't think that there's anything particularly uh, striking in principle about saying that if you're doing business in Canada, like Uber, um, that you should be subject to Canadian laws. Uh, I don't think there's anything particularly striking either about saying to Netflix or Google or Facebook who are doing business in Canada, who are selling advertising for Canadian eyes and Canadian ears, who are uh, harvesting data on how Canadians live their lives and using that to sell products and services. I don't think there's anything remarkable about the proposition that these companies should be subject to Canadian laws. Now, we can have a debate, and we should have a debate and a discussion about exactly what sort of laws they're subject to and with what sort of intensity. But I think in principle, uh, they absolutely should be subject to Canadian laws. Paul Daly is the University Research Chair in Administrative Law and Governments, Governance at the University of Ottawa, joining us on the Unpublished Cafe. And, you know, there's a lot, an awful lot of talk in this report that looks to the support and creation of ca- Canadian content. Do you see that as achievable in this report? Well, first of all, a lot of, there, there's a premise in the report, which is that Canadian content has to be supported. And there are people who, who might not agree with that. They might think, you know, just leave it to the, the market, uh, leave it to Netflix, leave it to uh, Crave, leave it to Amazon Prime to produce quality Canadian content. And that can be a, that can be a, a powerful argument. Um, but it has been a cornerstone of Canadian broadcasting policy for decades now, to support Canadian content. And so you shouldn't be attacking this report on the basis that it furthers a policy uh, which has been in place for decades. If you want to attack the policy, attack the policy, not the the report. I'd also say we're speaking in English. Um, I don't know uh, if your your audience is is pan-Canadian, but uh, also consider that the, the issue of Canadian content is very sensitive in French Canada, uh, particularly in the province of Quebec, where I worked for many years. Um, And that has to be treated with uh, significant sensitivity, I think. Uh, The Canadian content, Canadian French language content, is very important culturally and socially in the province of Quebec. And English Canadians who are debating this report and the future of broadcasting regulation should bear that in mind. Um, should also watch some of the uh, the French language content on Radio Canada because it's really excellent. You know, some would point to a, a possible constitutional battle if uh, if some of the impositions in this report were made, but you don't see it that way. Well, I think again we go back to the the conceptual point: what are these entities? Is Google like the Globe and Mail, or is it like Bell and, and Rogers and Telus? Um, And if it's like Bell, Rogers and Tellus, the case for regulation is much easier to make and the constitutional case is much easier to make. Um, Obviously, if you're regulating speech, if you're regulating what people can say on a platform, the constitutional barriers are very high. Um, But if you're just regulating how a platform operates, um, just asking for information about how they go about their business. And very, we lo- know very little about how Netflix and, and others do business in Canada. Uh, that's a very diff- different constitutional argument and one which is much easier to, uh, to make. Do you see any violation or possible violation in this report that would uh, come up uh, under the new NAFTA? Uh, the the NAFTA uh, the NAFTA issue is uh, is a tricky one for sure. Um, I think. Um, what you have to, or what lawmakers have to be careful about is uh, making provisions which are general in nature, which don't target foreign investors. Um, that's always been the case uh, in Canada. That's the, the world we live in, not just under NAFTA, but under a variety of free trade agreements. Um, but as long as the laws are general in nature, then um, you uh, Canadian lawmakers should be okay, and the Canadian taxpayer should not be on the on the hook for for paying uh, large amounts of damages. Um, but you know, uh, we live in a political world, and I'm sure the uh, the United States, with its political clout, and companies like Netflix and Facebook and Google, with their political clout, uh, will be uh, making extensive efforts to uh, uh, influence the debate and discussion uh, as this report comes to be implemented. Paul, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Paul Daly is a law professor and university research chair in administrative law and governance at the University of Ottawa.
The Broadcasting and Telecommunications Legislative Review Panel's final report could transform what we watch and listen to. But what are the costs? That's a question John Lawford would like answered. He's the executive director of the Public Interest Advocacy Center, and he joins us on the Unpublished Cafe. And John, do you see rising costs for consumers if these recommendations are adopted by the government? Uh, that is a possibility, Ed. Uh, what you've got is a vast change to the way Canadian content um, gets funded, however you define that. And uh, that could mean that all the carriers that want to bring you broadcasting content will have to put money in either productions or actually pay levies if they don't feel like doing productions or if they're not required to. And some, some services may not even be offered in Canada. That's another factor. So, say, for example, just to go on a bit, um, this new regulation uh, requires, say, uh, CBS All Access uh, to put some money into the Canadian CanCon pod and they don't feel like it, they may well just withdraw their service and geoblock it in Canada. You know, there, there is an awful lot of emphasis on the creation of Canadian content. And you know, I wonder how, if at all, you could, you could force, co- uh, force foreign companies to contribute. There's a bit of a game of international, I guess, cooperation uh, and coercion going on here. Um, by many countries, honestly. Uh, France has a similar type of structure for their film and television industry where they have been leaning on international platforms like Netflix to produce films in France. And uh, there's an OECD proposal to tax platforms for um, uh, for domestic um, consumption, if you will, because these things come from outside and and producers may or may not get in on the action in the local economy and may may or may not produce, for example, films in French in France and uh, Spanish in Spain and this sort of thing. So that's all going on at the moment. Um, Whether we're going to try to do it just by regulation and expect, as you say, everybody to follow CRTC rules, we'll see, or whether we should do it by trade agreement or moral persuasion as as we have been or international uh, cooperation we'll see you know for accessing online content you need to be online but for many canadians that prospect of reliable internet access is, is just a dream and and how does this report aim to close the gap if at all well it does make a couple of changes that are foundational um it's trying to uh buttress what's already in the telecommunications act um, that implies that we should all have universal access to broadband and make it quite explicit. So most countries have a universal service obligation. That means the companies have to build out their networks and provide basically the same service across the country, you know, whether you're rural, remote, or whatever. Um, and curiously, Canada's telecom legislation doesn't require that. So the, the, the report does say that we've got to fill that gap and have a universal service obligation, which is a great step forward. It does talk about some ways to try to fund that, but, um, you know, it's uh, many moving parts after that. And, um, and again, there's these pressures from the uh, other side of the equation, the content side, that might, uh, that might uh, add costs to, uh, to that side of it. What positives do you see for Canadians in this report? Uh, it's hard. This is a, a report that, I know it was a year and a half in the making and lots of effort went into it, but I got to say, Ed, you know, every time we try to fiddle with the broadcasting system over the last 40, 50 years, we pulled out this old thing, a Royal Commission, and we did hearings and lots of, lots and lots of work. And and this one's a, a little quicker. And I think was with the aim of really doing, having the broadcast tail wag the telecom dog. And that's unfortunate because the report comes with some big structural changes that I don't think were totally thought through legally. Really uproots a lot of um, assumptions about who should pay, as you're saying, for it, or and how are you going to make them do it, and uh, who has to put money in the pot. We haven't even talked about how this regulation is supposed to cover what they're calling news aggregator services and whether you can regulate the news. I mean, it's a huge structural thing, but there wasn't that much input um, other than written submissions. And it was a bit rushed, and the product, I think, shows it a bit. Um, so I'm kind of concerned that if the government implements it 
horse bullets, it'll be a bit of a mess. Yeah, you mentioned structural changes. Which ones? Which ones concern you? The the main structural change that concerns me is the broadcasting requirement to pay into this Canadian what they're calling the Canadian system. Whether you're an over the top delivered service like uh, you know like Hulu or whatever, and um, whether that can really fit in with the Canadian content model. What we will have to do to backstop that, you know, there isn't a lot of thought as to how disruptive it will be uh, if the plan, the best laid plan they've laid out doesn't pan out, I guess is where I'm going. Because you need a, a legal basis for this. And they've thrown out the definition of program and they've thrown out the definition of, um, they've thrown out the definition of uh the uh, the various categories we have now in the broadcasting act, like broadcaster, and replace them with words like aggregator and and cre- not creator. Um, there's another word for content it in the report, curator. but yeah, yeah, content curator. And and so you know these are new things with new definitions, and may or may not have um, you know years and years of legal fights to work out the edges of them. And I just I wish I'd seen more legal work to underpin all this before they. It's so fundamental to change. I mean, we have honestly a hundred years of broadcasting law, which kind of got um, reformulated overnight with this thing. So if it go, if it does go and try to be turned into a new act, it's going to be it's going to be difficult to write out. John, I want to thank you for joining us. Thanks, Ed. I don't want to make it sound like this is all sort of inside baseball stuff. This is really practical for consumers and. Um, I just want everybody to know that we are working on it for them and and we're going to try to make it a little bit more understandable, break it down into chunks because it's a huge report. But thanks for having me. Anytime, anytime. John Lawford is the executive director of the Public Interest Advocacy Center. On the political side of the broadcasting and telecommunications legislative review panel report, the conservatives felt it didn't go far enough, wasn't bold at all. Michelle Rempel Garner is the MP for Calgary Nose Hill and she joins us now and Michelle, I, I saw your, your comments when the report came out. You were looking for something to radically democratize the industry. W- what are you referring to? Well, look, I, the, the, the report itself was so broad and so far-reaching, and I, and I think some of the recommendations were just ludicrous, to be honest. But broadly speaking, we need to have a discussion in Canada about um, access, and affordability to wireless and uh, broadband services. Uh, But then we also need to um, be looking at some of the issues that the report raised uh, specific to privacy. Um, You know, prior to sort of uh, the political narrative rapidly changing in Canada over this week, we were talking about the fact that the Liberals had speculated about um, regulating uh, content on the Internet in in a very, uh, you know, undemocratic way. Um, the the government is is looking at recommendations in the report that would put a lot more regulations uh, on um, providers and users of data. And we're looking at different ways of dealing with that issue, like individual data ownership as opposed to just government regulation that might not work. So I guess, you know, for me, the the answer to that question is so broad. I'm happy to sort of delve down into specific issues, but I just found that the report itself was very insular and um, perhaps not as future forward or looking or as practical or as rooted in the concepts of free speech that, that it needed to be. Now you, you wanted to dig down a bit. Would you like to see more less or to see less regulation on the industry then? Well, okay, let's talk about, let's use an example. Um, the, the issue of Facebook or Google um, having access to enormous amounts of private information. What are they doing with that? Um, the, the reality is, is that data, the data that you create when you do a Google search or like something on Facebook or, you know, swipe your debit card, all of that has value that, uh, companies, like this is a, this is the fastest growing industry in the world. It has trillions of dollars worth of work. So the data you create actually has value. So questions have been raised on, okay, well, what does privacy look like in that environment, especially when you just click through like this massive terms of, uh, of reference or agreement, right? And um, I, I think that 
some of the responses that we've seen internationally, like um, the, the yeah, European piece of legislation, the GDPR, it, it's looking at regulations, right? And some of that is good, but I, I think that we're moving into a, a point of time where regulation is, is unenforceable or will become unenforceable. And the Americans are looking at things sort of on the opposite side of the spectrum. They're looking at antitrust legislation to break some of these companies up. What I would like to see is us examine the concept of saying, look, this the data you create has value. If you own that data, right, if, 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 if same way you own your labor, then that has value. You should be able to, 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 to put a value on that. And there's a lot of new economic theory that's being created that um, – essentially would allow that to happen. And that's where I would like the government to, our government in Canada, at least look at some of this theory prior to us, um, uh, prior to us just embarking on a massive expansion of government, because I'm not sure we need to protect privacy and we need to ensure that that happens. But I'm not sure that regulation is necessarily going to do that uh, the way that's being described in the report. And then how do we get uh, better support of privacy? Well, again, I think that that's probably um, it's, it's probably more of a complicated question in that there's different scopes of privacy, right? So, for example, I do think that we need to look at protecting Canadians from government intrusion on their privacy in a much more holistic way. Like, I don't think that we put adequate bounds around that. Um, so that's one area that I do think that we probably need some legislative and regulatory framework. And then with regard to privacy, I actually think it, it, we can't look at it sort of homogeneously from the perspective of what Facebook is doing with your data. If um, So, for example, uh, you know, like I have a 17-year-old stepson. I, I, he probably doesn't think about uh, his privacy in the same way that somebody else would, right? Like he's like, I don't care what's out there right now. Um, but his data does have value and I'd like him to have the opportunity to be able to have the option of, of saying, you know, okay, well maybe, maybe I should be compensated for that. And there's concepts like data cooperatives, which I think in the next five to 10 years will become more prevalent. And um, those are the sort of things that we're trying to look at right now. We're having a study, although parliament is suspended right now, but we're about to embark upon a study that would look at some of these concepts, which I think is pretty neat. Michelle Rempel Garner is joining us on the Unpublished Cafe, conservative industry critic and MP for Calgary, Nose Hill. And in terms of the the report, telecommunications companies, uh, you address this in after you just read the report. You feel they have too much sway in the industry. Well, I think that if what we're trying to manage to as as a country is access to an affordability of wireless and broadband services. We're far behind other countries. I mean, uh, Americans pay far less, and certainly the Europeans pay far less than we do uh, for access to these services. Um, and I think that we could be looking at ways to acknowledge that this is this is rapidly becoming, I think, almost in the, in the realm of a public good, especially now that I think in the next few weeks, as many Canadians are going to be, you know, spending more time at home, it sounds like working from home for those who have the uh, ability to do that. Our networks, we're going to be asking questions like, you know, let's let's say a university is cancelled, right? If somebody doesn't have affordable access to wireless services or broadband services, how are they able to participate in that? Mm -hmm. And I think that because the telecommunications companies have sort of through regulation over a long period of time, really been able to set the narrative on pricing and uh, access. And I, again, like I'm, I'm a conservative, so I believe in free market. And I think, you know, obviously there should be an opportunity to make profit, but we also have to make sure that um, access to these services, as much as like access to roads, isn't stifling our economy or creating inequality and class divisions. And I don't think that the government across political stripe has added, adequately looked at that. And as our country moves into a 5G operating environment, uh, I think this is going to become even more, more acute. You know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, I guess, uh, red flags that popped up as soon as that report was issued, uh, the minister making comment about uh, regulating or you know, regulating trusted news sites, information sites. Uh, and <laughs> That is just ludicrous. <laughs> that's, that's, that's ludicrous. That mm-hmm. is crazy talk. Um, I can't, I'm sorry to interrupt you on it. I just, I read that and I just lost it. 
I, I think, um, you know, for me, it's, if we need to provide more tools to Canadians to really think like, you know, you know, critical thinking skills on how to evaluate what's on the internet, that's one thing, but saying that the government has a role to, to regulate that is just crazy. We already have legal frameworks for libel, for, for, for hate speech, for uh, criminal harassment, um, there's, you know, jurisprudence being created uh, as we transition into, you know, a different way that we communicate. Like, that's that's happening right now. I just, I think that, like, saying that the government, that's the government's role, is is just ludicrous. And it's not, it, it's, it's the antithesis of free speech. It's bananas. Well, Such an overreach. Yeah, okay. It, 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 free, well, free speech isn't free. We know that. But in, in, in terms of trusted news sites... The, the thing that I've always wanted to, to get an answer on is how do we make sure that you're getting the accurate information? Whether you like the information or not is, is, is irrelevant. It's the accurate information, and then you make your decision. How do we get that? Yeah, and I mean, but I mean, like, every news site is going to have some level of bias, right? Um, I think that Canadians have to look at, uh, you know, say, like, well, what's the editorial process? of the news site that I'm looking at, right? Um, is it a typical, is it a mostly opinion site or is it, does it actually have an investigative journalist doing work? What is their editorial board look like? You know, like those are questions like we should be teaching Canadians if they, if they, if those aren't questions that they're asking themselves, um, then, then, you know, that needs to be part of our education process. But saying that the government is going to select which people can have the truth and others don't. I, I, Ooh, that gives me shivers, and I, I, I don't think anybody should be supporting that. No, I hear, I hear you there. Uh, one of the other recommendations is uh, have the CBC get out of advertising altogether and uh, and just be government funded. Uh, is that something you would support, or do you think they should be is still in the advertising game? Well, you know, last year we started talking about what the role of government should be in terms of provision of and support for media services when the government announced a, you know, half billion dollar plus bailout for print media services. And so in that situation, you've got the government, like the prime minister's office, putting together a set of criteria uh, on who is going to dole that money out and under what circumstances. So you already have the state sort of saying, like, who is an approved news source, which I took issue with. I think that it's time for us to have, given that, you know, how we've changed, uh, how we consume information has changed. I mean, people are going to be listening to this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, this wasn't possible or a thing, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, We should really be having a broader conversation on what the state's role is in providing certainly news services uh, and and how that, how we're funding that. Um, I think it's that, that conversation is long overdue. And I think that we should be looking at that across the board, be it print, CBC, whatever, um, because we're spending a lot of money on it. And I think Canadians need to have a say in how their tax dollars are spent uh, going forward. Michelle, I want to thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for reaching out. Michelle Rempel Garner is the MP for Calgary Nose Hill and conservative industry critic. Now it's time for you to make your voice heard. Our unpublished dot vote question is Do you feel the Canadian media needs to be regulated any more than it already is? Log on and vote at unpublished dot vote and have your voice heard. I want to thank my guests today Michael Geist, Tom Korski, Paul Daly. John Lawford, and Michelle Rempel-Garner for joining us on the podcast. And I'd like to thank you for listening to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand.